Hi, welcome to A New African, where we tell our stories without changing the narrative. While looking at the future with optimism, we also aspire to remain relevant in our present times. Hello, and welcome to our new podcast. My name is Mwaba Mwaba, or you can simply call me Mwaba, but only if we're friends. <laughs> Allow me to introduce my co-host, Dr. Molapo Selepe. Hi, Ray. It's good to be here, Mwaba. Uh, Great. Mwaba, if I was to. <laughs> yes, because we're friends now, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Very good. Now, this podcast is about the truth about Africa that no one has ever told you. This is about our truth, our African truth, the historical truth. And we are on a mission to tell it to whoever will listen, whoever will hear it, whoever will read it and learn, aren't we? We are on a mission, certainly. Yeah. So welcome. This is going to be a YouTube and podcast series. And um, so you have written three books, not one, not two, three books in a row. I know that you've written a couple of other books before, but what motivated you to write three books in a row? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that intro, uh, Mwaba. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mulapo Slepe. I come from South Africa. And yes, I have written uh, this trilogy called A New African. I wrote it in three books because Mwaba, the volume was just too big. Right. Um, okay. I just had so much to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I needed to make it digestible for all yeah. of us. Great. Um, and so I divided into our past, our present, and our future. And that's very uh, interesting. So this right here is our past. Yes, that's, that's book that, one. That's book one, African history. Our past. And book two? And book two is um, really looking at the present issues in yep. Africa. And lastly, it is looking at the future. Just Great. project projecting into the horizon and uh, you know, being able to look for ahead and see what Africa can we create. Mm. Um, mm. And yes, that's, uh, that's the summary of the three books. Great. A new African. And I've noticed you've spelled African with a K. Can you tell me more about that? What is that about? Because I've always known Africa to be spelled with a C, and I'm sure many of our listeners or viewers would mm. attest to the fact. So why African or Africa with a K? Yeah, as you know, that um, the name African comes from um, the uh, Roman mm. emperor who um, <clears throat> first had ruling on, uh, in northern Africa, mm. uh, who was called Africanus. Um, and um, so it's spelled with C, but it doesn't really quite, uh, you know, it, it doesn't resonate with the African linguistics. Mm. So in African linguistics, it will have a K sound. Um, yeah. So African yeah. will, um, will have a, a K sound. So C does not... Uh, really um, have a, 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 a K sound. Right. Uh, and so that's why I have um, decided not to include C in the African, mm -hmm. uh, but to remember that uh, the original name for Africa is al Kebulan, which means uh, the Garden of Eden. Right. Um, so al Kebulan has its, its the, 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 the al -ke, K there is with a K. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is for that reason that I have uh, uh, included uh, the K instead of the C in the new Africa. So why did it have a C in the first place? Whose idea was it to call it Africa with a C? That's what I would really like to know, as I'm sure most of our viewers or podcast listeners would. Too. Yes, yes. You, you're right. So uh, as I said, it, it, it has got uh, Roman origins. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a European um, uh, description right. of, of the land beyond the Mediterranean mm -hmm. uh, from European point of view uh, which was under Emperor Africanus right. and so um, yes that's where the sea comes from right. um, so if 
I mean, we will not call Africa Africa if it was by us. So the original name for us would be Al Kebulan, and it has got the K sound. Fantastic. And, mm. and that, viewers or listeners, is a reason why we're here to tell the truth, our truth, our historical truth, which has been told for us practically hey. for as long as we can remember. Man, and, and that's what we really need to um, work on. Mm. You see, our story is our story, and it's got to be told by us. Yes. There is something absolutely wrong, Waba. Yes. Um, Waba. Uh, there's, some, <laughs> there's something absolutely wrong if we're going to allow other people mm. to tell us our story when they don't know what's happening in our psyche, yes. what's happening in our world. Yes. Um, it, 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 it just um, it creates a very a difficult dynamic mm, mm. Um, and, um, and in that equation um, you will find that you know, Africans will be um, somewhat badly, um, badly placed, as it were. And presented. Exactly. Or misrepresented. Misrepresented. Yeah, you see. yeah. So um, we've got to find a way to tell our story our own way, and this is the whole idea behind this project. Yeah. So I would like to warn our viewers that some of the content that we'll discuss in this podcast is going to mm. shake our thoughts. It's going to you know, provoke some of the things that we know about Africa. So Certainly. it's not really for the faint-hearted, is it? No, <laughs> it's not for the faint-hearted. Look, all things um, equal, yeah. um, you know, Africa has always been disturbed by the external forces. Yes. Uh, but if we are allowed to, to tell our story, mm. we mm. will do it and we will do it properly. Um, and and that's the, you know the opportunity that we are creating. If we don't create this opportunity, Moaba, mm, it mm. will not happen. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. So I would encourage our viewers and our listeners and everybody who reads uh, Dr. Molapo's books to wrestle with some of the truths that you will find out. To wrestle with some of the you know facts that will come up because mm. I would rather you are in that space rather than you hear it or you read about it mm. and you dismiss it. Mm. or you just accept it and, and not, you know, question it. So it's a very good space where we can um, look at what we have always known. And, 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 you know, someone once said that the definition of intelligence is uh, the ability to entertain a new idea. So yes. there's a lot of um, some ideas that will seem new to some of us, mm. you know, because some of the things that we've just talked about in the first few minutes already are things that I never heard about, not in school, not in our history classes. Certainly. And, and you know, just, uh, you know, adding to what you were saying, mm. um, the mark of a good success is teachability. Yeah. Um, we've got to be able to listen mm -hmm. and uh, to look at things anew. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, you know, this is what this opportunity gives us. Gives us a chance to unlearn Mm, what mm, we know yeah. and to give us a chance to relearn. That's right. Um, and if we are teachable, we'll go a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've written three books. You're a medical doctor, mm -hmm. practicing medical doctor. You're a mentor. You're a father to two gorgeous young people, <laughs> Ria and Halle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, you know, that just lights up my world. Thank you yeah. for mentioning them. Yeah. Have you have you, have they read your books? Have they read have they read this book? <laughs> they have read the book. In fact, if you read in the intro, I I have actually dedicated this project to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um yes, I you know, as, not only to them, to all the young Africans. Yeah. As you know, the average age of a typical African is 18, mm -hmm. uh, which is the area's age. Yeah. Um, and uh, if we don't create and provide leadership, as it were, yeah. uh, then it becomes a huge problem because then our youth don't have a, a guiding light or a yeah. guiding beacon, as it were. So, yes, I wrote it in dedication to them and also to all African young people and not so young people. Right. So what do they think about your books? Have they given you some feedback about They books? have. They have. <laughs> my little daughter, she's only 14, <laughs> Harley. Uh, she thinks that the English is just too big. Uh, I, say, I say, look, you know, it's a chance to learn. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just, right. just, just a chance to learn. 
And uh, Noria is, is a dynamic young man. He's always loved books, so he is really into it and he's, he's loved it. Yeah, yeah. So where did you find the time, being a father, being a you know, practicing medical doctor, a mentor, you're a runner and a community developer, mm. all of that. Where did you find the time? Because I've, I've read the books and um, they're very well researched. Where did you find the time? <laughs> <laughs> Where did the time find me? Perhaps that's yeah, the question. Yeah, because yeah. time has always been, uh, which is why I have written the book as well as a new African, because Africa has always been. Yeah, so yeah. the question is not really uh, Africa, it is the African. Yeah. And the time, the question is not time, actually, it's just whether can we be found by time, because time has always been there. So you, you make time. Yeah, so yeah. Um, in 24 hours, um, you know, you just have to... Uh, prioritize what you want to do. And I, I, I decided, look, I want to write a literary jam for Africans. I want yeah. to leave something that Africans can um, look back at as mm -hmm. a reference mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to make time for it. So yeah. I budgeted that time. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a day, I put aside two hours. It took me, it's taken me t uh, about two years to write uh, the two, books? Two and a half years, but, you know, wow. uh, that's how wow. you do it, one one day at a time. So I, yeah. I dedicated two, two hours a day. <laughs> wow, that's commitment. That's certainly commitment. So if anybody wants to write a book, two hours a day, two hours a day, that's commitment. Well done. Well, um, I, for one, I'm very, very grateful that you took the time to write mm. these books because mm. this has changed my perception about a lot of things that I wow. learned about in school wow. or didn't wow. learn about. Mm. I remember just this morning I was uh, with my son in the car and I said to him, did you know this and this and that? And I quoted something you have said in your book. And he said, no, mom, I didn't know. And I said, wow. well, Dr. Malapo has written books and we're going to be talking about them. Wow. And, uh, you know, some of the things, oh, my God. So I mentioned something and he says, oh, wow, did you know that, man? And I said, no, I didn't. So I'm very, very grateful that you have um, written the books and took the time to do all yeah. this research. You see, Mwaba, that's, that's why, you know, I wrote the book. It was really to governate a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad. Yes. You know, that, those conversations, especially that conversation yeah. between you and your son is the yeah. most pivotal. And, and so yeah. um, just to trigger those conversations goes a long way. So mm -hmm. I'm glad. That's right. Mm. So... I'll read a little bit about, um, remember I did say that uh, some of the content we're going to discuss is going to be controversial. It's all factual. It's based on um, evidence. It's got uh, scholars that you have quoted, a whole lot of them. Do you know how many you know, references you have in your book? I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, on yeah. average, it's about 50 per chapter. So, the, you know, wow. multiply by 22 chapters. So that's quite a number. That's a good number of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. other authorities that you have. So that, that sounds to me like you obviously cared about making sure that the facts were right. Yes. And, and yes. we are not here to reinvent the wheel. So you mm. wrote the books. Mm. I've read the books. Mm. And now I can talk about it with you. What a privilege. What a privilege. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and you know, the reason really for, um, for, for referencing and making sure that um, you know, there is, uh, we're talking facts, mm -hmm. it is because you know, we're living at a time now where everything has got to be evidence-based. Yeah, yeah. The stuff that I'm talking about in the book, anybody can go research that. You can yeah. find stuff on Google and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So in yeah. order for it to actually make sense, yeah. it's got to be directed, it's got to be rational, yeah. it's got yeah. to be logical. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why, you know, that's the value of putting time yeah. um, and uh, really creating a, a story mm -hmm. um, in a way that, um, you know, it's got an evidence that we can, we can look back at mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. a formidable, reliable evidence. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So read something from your book. This is from mm -hmm. chapter one, uh -huh. um, page four. Mm -hmm. To tell the African story, you must start right from the outset. Mm -hmm. Africa is a cradle of humanity. Archaeological evidence from Ethiopia, Tanzania, South Africa, all profess to Africa being the birthplace of humanity. Someone, you've quoted someone who, who said this. Mm -hmm. yeah? 
another African, an amazing, amazing scholar, the Senegalese genius, Cheikh Anta Diop. Can you tell me more about Diop, please? Uh, Sheikh Anta Diop was an amazing scholar. Yeah. Um, that as Africans, we owe so much um, to. In fact, he's referred to as the number one ranked Mm-hmm. Um, African scholar for the 21st century. Wow. He's done a great work. Um, and really it is, uh, he's, he's a vanguard, as it were, mm-hmm. in terms of changing the narrative yeah. Yeah. of how we used to perceive um, ourselves as a continent. Yeah. Remember the last 500 years were, 100, were, were 500 years of subjugation. Mm-hmm. And that subjugation included stealing away our culture Mm -hmm. and stealing away the evidence of our regions and so on and so forth. So our reference point has always been Mm -hmm. um, Europe. And to have an African history through the European lenses Mm -hmm. was really a big uh, disadvantage for us. And here is a man who's taken time um, and yeah, he's um, he's French trained, he's from Senegal, yep, uh, yep. but he's done a lot of work, especially around Egyptology. Yep. Um, it's a subject on its own, um, Egyptology. No doubt. But certainly, wha- the, once we start to look at the work that Egyptians have done um, in the light of the whole continent, yep. um, it's incredible. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. And and mind you, um, not only when we talk Egypt, we're not only talking about the current uh, Egypt as a country, you know, we're talking about the whole area of Nubia, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. includes Sudan and the Horn of Africa. Uh, And also we're talking about big empires in the past, like Mali Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and Morocco, uh, where the first universities in the world were. Um, So um, all that evidence... Um, you know the the man who's really work uh, tremendous work yep. uh, in bringing it forth yes. um, and telling us a new history which is not racially biased mm. Uh, mm. was mm. Uh, Sheikh Ante Diop. So he was not the first one to make such a suggestion, but he mm. certainly was the first scholar to defend the thesis in mm. several provocative books, including you know the African origin of civilization and and mm. so forth. Mm. Um, so what I know, um, I guess the, the advantage that you and I have today, mm-hmm. especially yourself who has authored, you know, so many books and three books on African history alone, goodness mm-hmm. me, um, Diop certainly did not have a platform such as what we have today, mm-hmm. right? We mm-hmm. can, we can go, um, to our audience, to any audience, um, mm-hmm on a podcast or on YouTube mm. and, and so on and, and share some of the things that we are finding out. So mm. it says here that um, Diop's work was challenged, you know, um, it challenged the very heart of the doctrines mm. of racism and the negative argument arguments that had been made against Africa by many European and American authors. Mm. Um, the African story in this book is to acknowledge all those, you know, um, things that he's talked about. Mm. What what can you say to uh, up and coming authors today who who do, who do not have, you know, the I guess the resources that Diop would have had? Because he would have struggled to to send the message across as we have read in your book. Yes. I mean look even at the moment, um, as we know that Africa is still primarily and essentially governed, Mm -hmm. Um, there is no central um, governance in Africa, Um, there is no central determination in Africa. In fact, it's a taboo subject. If once Mm -hmm. you start to Mm -hmm. talk African nationality or nationalism, um, you raise eyebrows and uh, you can be quietened um, fairly easily yes. um, and as, quickly, uh, quickly. At that, yes. uh, yeah. and as we know um, people like Nkwame Nkrumah who started uh, the African Union back in 1963 mm. um, this is the vision that uh, our, our leaders had to unite us yeah. um, but unfortunately 
um, we've, we, you know, they've faced resistance, yeah. and that resistance continues up mm -hmm. to today. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, uh, look, in terms of making sure that uh, we uh, propel our voice forward, mm -hmm. um, we should not be intimidated. Right. Um, we should listen to the small still voice that speaks into our hearts yeah. because we all come to into this world to mm. make a certain contribution yeah. and yeah. if you've got a um, you know um, a burning issue or a desire to express something your contribution is very important yeah, certainly. Um, and that's what I would say to you to those people who feel inspired mm. or somewhat mm. have got issues that yeah. don't settle well with them or mm -hmm. make them angry yeah. Uh, yeah. They are there because they need us to sort them out. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, for me, <laughs> a big issue that I have a problem with is our continent. Yeah. So it's a huge, huge problem. Yes. And uh, I must say, often it intimidates me. Well, <laughs> how do we get around this big, this big, big place. Pro problem? You know? yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I love the African um, proverb that says, uh, how do you eat an elephant? You know, yeah. um, one bite at a time. Oh, good. good. So uh, yeah. you know, we've we've seen big animals in Africa. You know, yes. big beasts. That's right. And we can still conquer them. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. What about because uh, this is and this is a bit of a um, a, a personal confession, I guess. Mm. Um, hello, <laughs> confessing on <laughs> on the podcast. Reading is not something that uh, comes naturally to mm. um, to a lot of us Africans, mm. and I'm generalizing here. So, um, mm. but I do know that a whole bunch of my friends that I talk to, even today, I was talking to you know one of my friends about uh, the books that uh, we're reading and we are going to talk about on a podcast, and they said, "Oh my God, um, how how do you read? You've read three books in how long? So it's it's like it's such a foreign concept. How do we?" How do you encourage people? Because I believe that um, a lot of a lot of um, the issues is because we don't go out there and seek this information. Mm. It's there, mm. um, but we don't we don't deliberately and mm. intentionally mm. read. What mm. is your your you know experience of, of reading in our culture? Mm. Look, I think it's part of the whole system to really um, discourage us from um, the written word. Um, a written word is, is amazing because mm -hmm. it, it uh, implants something in our psyche, yeah. in, in our minds, mm -hmm. and it triggers imagination. Yeah. And that imagination we are able to express either in spoken word or even in action. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, books are amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and we should not be discouraged. Look at people like Chimamanda, the impact yeah. they've had in the whole world just by believing and understanding the power of a written word. Um, and so um, you see a lot of the, the problems that we have in Africa is that our history or our story was not written down. Yes. And, and so because we come from a background of oral history, right. um, we are able to preserve some of the knowledge, but some of that knowledge if we are having uh, such a direct um, uh, onslaught, as it were, yes. from other cultures, yeah. it becomes very easy to lose some mm -hmm. of the information. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the reason why I've written them down is so that it's, it's a well-preserved and well-written and well-researched work that we can look back at. You know, for instance, if we claim that African land is our, is our land, yeah. where do we start? How That's do we right. know that it is our land? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it can be just my word versus your word. Yes. Uh, and so when it's written down, then it becomes something that is um, reliable, yes. that is factual. Yes. And you can refer to That we it. can refer to. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's the power of written word. Mm -hmm. It may not be popular, yeah. But that's where we need to start. That's right. And so we'll make it easy for other people. We provide audio, um, audio books and, and, and such. Mm -hmm. And podcasts yeah. help a lot as well to yeah. start to talk about some of the content. Yeah. Mm. So you've written the books. I guess our job is to read them <laughs> and, and carry on and have some conversations about it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and, and this is what tends to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. once... Um, 
we have spoken about uh, the book yeah. and you share with your friend, mm. uh, that word of mouth is very powerful. Yes. And before we know it, we are a people uh, that gravitate towards a certain written work. Uh, because it has got some meaning and some purpose for us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, and that's what I've done with these books, is just to make sure that um, it is something that is uh, reliable, yeah. something that is worthy, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, is, is a legacy for our children. Right. Um, you know, it, it is sad because a lot of, you know, say around the 18th century, for mm -hmm. instance, um, you know the African um, story is is huge, yes. but most of that is not preserved. Mm. Um, and so when I was searching, looking for that, those gems from back then, yes. um, it it hits you um, the importance of you know writing, writing some of the things down. down. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. Well, thank you so much for that. We're going to cut to um, a short break, and we'll see you back um, in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hello and welcome back from our short break. So before we went away, we were talking yeah. about some of the things that, you know, you have written in the book. And mm. I know reading the book, um, I found some very fascinating uh, facts about things like the first university in the yeah. world yeah. was actually in Africa. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I found that to be quite uh, interesting. Yeah, um, you know, it's really... Mm -hmm. Fascinating, you're right. Mm -hmm. um, around the eighth, the ninth century, um, the first university in Africa was in Morocco, um, and um, and this one sh shortly after that was University of Sankora, mm -hmm. which was in Mali, uh, in um, in uh, Timbuktu, yep. place University of. of uh, uh, in, in, in Timbuktu, University of Timbuktu. So, um, yes, a lot of African knowledge can be traced back to even a tertiary level um, in, in Africa. And, uh, and that was a leading uh, education in Africa, yeah. a leading education internationally, um, and a lot of people forget that we actually, as Africans, transferred knowledge um, to overseas, especially Europe, twice. First, it was around um, the fourth century before Christ, yeah. uh, when the Egyptians transferred knowledge uh, to the Greeks. Yeah. But secondly, it was around the eighth. Um, century, which is around the time when this university was uh, started, wow. during the black, the so-called Black Ages, um, when knowledge was transferred from um, the from uh, North Africa yeah. or uh, Morocco um, or Carthage, that that area, to um, the Latin. To, to the Latin Europe, uh, mainly Spain and, and, and Rome. And Rome. Yeah. So um, we transferred knowledge north uh, of the Mediterranean twice in history, but the history is very silent about that. I know. That's what I was actually wondering about. Why is that not talked about? I would like to have gone to college and I would have liked to go to a university. And the first thing I learned about is, did you know that the first university ever was actually in Africa, right? Imagine what that would uh, would do to an African young kid in exactly. a university. I think that would be quite um, inspiring. It is to you know. know. It is, uh, and I think that we, as the, as the world, we are really uh, we we are letting down Africa or ignoring Africa to yes. our own peril, as yeah. it were. 
um, you know, there's a concept of the haploeve, um, which it traces back through the mitochondrial DNA, yeah. the origins of humanity. Mm. Um, yeah. And it's a very interesting piece of, um, of, of research and, and science because it traces back the first human to be the so-called haploeve, who the understanding is that she could have uh, been um, somewhere in Botswana uh, or, or thereabouts. So mm. the science mm. goes back there. Yeah. yeah. And if you trace your background through the maternal lineage, mm. it really helps to uh, orientate you in terms of your origin and your stability as, hum as, as, as a human being. And I think it is very important as humanity, the whole world, yeah. to appreciate that our origins are in Africa, not just just in terms of human origins, yes, but also in terms of um, civilization. Yes, and when we ignore that, mm. then we wipe out a big part of our history. Um, that then leads to what we see: the disjointed world, um, factionalized world, uh, classed world, mm. and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, and it, it makes you see the world differently. It that, does. It um, really does. So our traditional way of defining who is an African changes completely. Yes. Because mm. if all humans come from Africa, all humans are African. Um, as uh, Robert Sugwiko once said, that there's only one uh, race in this world, and that is the human race. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's quite um, interesting to me how... Um, you know, we we don't know that. And like mm. we spoke about uh, before we went for a short break, we don't read enough, I think, mm. uh, um, as, a, as a society. And I, I speak for myself that I, it was something that I had to be intentional about. Mm. And I just remember how hard it was, you know, for me to be able to teach my son to, to read as to much, read. Um, you know, to get this information. Mm. One of the other facts that um, I have found in your book, and I think um, it goes without saying that, not anymore, we won't ignore, you know, <laughs> our history. Yes, <laughs> Not yes. after reading these books, for mm, sure. Mm. And I found that the richest person who ever lived was an African king. What about that? What, what went through your mind first before you answered that? You know, what did, what did you think about when you came across that piece of information? And I don't know how long it's been since you've known that. Yeah. But... Um, how did you feel to know that? Well, it, it was a shocking piece of history. Yeah. Um, I guess it, I, I, th I think it goes with, along with many other information that we know of, of Africa. Mm. My favorite uh, chapter in the book is uh, called African Privilege. And mm. uh, there I go into details of a lot of other things where we think yeah. we have been dis uh, you know, disadvantaged, as it were. Yeah. Um, and the so-called, even nowadays people talk about the white privilege, referring mm. to the European privilege yes. and all those yes. sorts of things. Yeah. And then we yeah. don't realize as Africans that we have been so privileged um, in terms of the natural resources, yeah. our, our oh, yeah. natural riches and so forth. Yeah. So going back to uh, the emperor, uh, who is called uh, Mansa Musa. Mm -hmm. Mansa Musa was the great uh, emperor of the great Mali kingdom uh, with Ghana around yep. the 13th century. Um, he was a great man. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he used to take a big entourage to Mecca. Wow. Um, and uh, the whole world used to marvel at him. And he would take with him all sorts of... Um, uh, you know, precious metals, um, gold, um, you know, a huge entourage of, of camels. Um, and he would donate along, you know, when along he takes way. a Mecca, he yeah. would actually empower those nations that he's going through. Wow. Um, and uh, there's never been um, any... Anybody richer and, and than him, richer than I him. believe. Yeah. And then we need to be, you know, my thinking um, yeah. Marba, is that we need to be very careful because um, the people, the, you know, if you look at the high tech, um, you know, first 10 richest people in the world, yes, a lot of them are made rich 
by Africa. Yes. Our resources, not only just natural resources, but also human resources. Yes. Um, if you look at, for instance, Louis Vuitton mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. guy, the French um, guy, um, he's, um, he's uh, one of the richest people. I mean, he, he keeps... Fluctuating. Uh, fluctuating between <laughs> him, him and George Bezos. Uh, you know, they keep changing every month, that type of thing. But, you know, uh, these are the people who are made rich by our own insatiable need to buy this stuff um, and um, this cultural need to always be consumers. And we take it to another level, you know. Yeah. Um, I saw the other day in South Africa, uh, there's a guy that had a party uh, thrown um, and they spent one million rands wow. on booze. How much is that in Australian dollars? Uh, just uh, in this, case, that's, you know? that's, that's about hundred dollars, um, $100,000. $100,000 $100, on a wedding. On a booze, just on a oh, bad, birthday party. Or birthday party. And, yeah. and that was not alcohol which was drunk. Uh, no, they didn't drink the alcohol. No, they they bought the uh, alcohol. No, they on. just poured the alcohol on the guy. Are you kidding? Uh, talk about uh, art, uh, <laughs> art wastage. Um, wow. and, and, and it's just a sheer um, element of consumerism. It's gone to another level. Um, and in the process, we are making uh, the producers of this world, uh, yeah. mainly uh, based in Europe, yes. Germany, yeah. Uh, yeah. France, the cars, you know, the, um, the breweries, uh, you name it. We are making these people rich. They look rich, but really the real wealth is coming from us. It's interesting you say that because I've actually... Um, for, for the entire series that will be producing this show, I've mm. made a decision that I'm not going to wear a new dress. Wow. I am going to recycle. So um, wow. this dress in particular that I'm wearing today mm -hmm. is actually a dress that I wore to my brother's wedding nearly 11 years ago. My goodness. And so uh, this is <laughs> me amazing. proving, right? Th That's this is me amazing. proving to myself that I don't need to buy something new mm. every single time I'm going somewhere exactly. so that it ends up in landfill, mm. right? Wow. So uh, I will recycle as much as I can. Mm. And uh, if anyone hears me going to buy a new dress for the show, please stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of a new concept, uh, of a new concept where you actually recycle your old clothes yes so um you know if you've got clothes that you really don't use anymore yes you call um a group of your friends yes. and, and you swap you swap swap old yes that would be amazing um, i'd love to do that if anybody is running a swap something ceremony somewhere please let me know because i'll bring my clothes and you can bring your clothes and we'll swap because yeah. i'm gonna need a lot of clothes for what we're doing with this show right certainly certainly <laughs> yeah. uh, you know there's there's many ways that we can cut the costs yeah and um, we don't have to always spend you that's know? it i think yeah. that's the problem that, you know um, mm. sometimes mm. we've got leaking hands you know yes, when we've got we money do. in our hands we, yeah. we think it needs to leave us yeah that's um, right yeah so we need to find ways to um you know, preserve um, our money as much as and we our, can. Our wealth, yes. Uh, not just preserve it, but find a way to make it grow as well. Yeah, that's mm. right. So one of the other characters you mention in your book, and I'm, I mean, I know that there's uh, these places I'll, I'll be telling our, our viewers and our listeners in a minute where to get your books. Mm. Um, a queen, an African queen, um, who prevented slave trade or stopped or did whatever she could to mm. fight for her people's freedom for 30 years. Mm. And today we have something like you write in your book about 100 million Africans in Brazil who've got uh, ancestors in. I had no idea about very, that. Can you, can you please tell our it, viewers and listeners it, more about that? Yeah, it's very interesting. Mwaba. You know, it, one of the things we, we talked earlier about what actually triggered my interest in, in writing the book. Yeah. And I remember one of my patients, a young girl from Venezuela. Yeah. Um, she's very talented in arts and she had this big um, artwork, yeah. um, which is a, an African slave. Uh, slave. Um, so an old queen or an, just an old you know, mater, uh, matriarchal icon for her. Yeah. 
imaginary. But she was, she was black, right. and this was a Latin or well, Latino girl. Um, yes. But in her mind, when she goes back to who her ancestors were, yeah. she looked at an African old lady. Wow. Uh, because wow. she believes that it was the lady, the, the, you know, old people who came as slaves from Africa. Yep. That she could trace her ancestor, uh, ancestors to. And connect to. Uh, yeah. And, and that's the, really the history of South America. Mm. Um, South America got occupied um, in terms of recent history. Yeah. Going back uh, in, into the 15th century, uh, 16th century, a lot of um, South America and, and North America was occupied through slavery, tra transatlantic slavery. Yes. So around the Queen uh, Queen Nzinga, she was a great Angolan, um, you know, matric. Uh, she's loved in Angola. If you just have to speak to any Angolan, they will tell you about the yeah. history of this remarkable woman yeah. Yeah. Um, who was um, wise, she was great in war, mm. Mm. Um, and um, a, a diplomat, um, a remarkable lady. Um, and, and so when the Portuguese came to um, the western shores of Africa, uh, back in the middle of um, uh, the 16th century, mm. um, she um, she was um, you know she she was the the, the, the queen yeah, yeah. Uh, and she defended her people um, yes for over thirty years wow um, and that was you know back and forth of negotiations um, but obviously um, you know this over time um, you know our our leadership was overpowered yeah. um, and uh, and as a result the transatlantic uh, trade um, started, mm, um, yeah. which was a huge, uh, the slavery, transatlantic slave trade, um, you know, it's huge, but there's a lot of work that has gone into that. Uh, but the origins of that in terms of even how, um, you know, um, the, 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 the um, goods are transferred across the world, um, you can trace it back to um, how things were working around that time. Yeah. Um, even um, e even capitalism itself you can yeah. trace it back to how things were arranged during the transatlantic um, slave trade. Slave, mm. tr slave trade. Mm. Thirty years. Thirty, 30 years. years. That's like a lifetime that she managed to defend her people. It it talks to it talks to the power. Yes. Um, the strength. Yeah. The agility uh, and the depth mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, our leadership then, and the ability to defend ourselves over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You get an impression that, you know, when y Europeans came to Africa, they found people who were just uh, vulnerable. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, no, you know, they found kingdoms which were well uh, established well and they were you know, and strong in leadership yeah because exactly. i i read that she actually was learning about politics she studied politics and and leadership when she was a child exactly you know that's just um and, yeah. and it and it goes to show again that you know i think sometimes when we think about um the uh, cultural setup in africa mm -hmm. um we don't have um women as as leaders and um I have not done extensive work, but that's another work to be done. That's extensive right. work yeah. in terms of the role that our African women have played mm. in the history mm. of Africa. Mm. 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 Wow, fantastic. That's, um, well, there you have it. That's uh, the end of our chapter one that we have been talking about tonight. Um, what a privilege. What an amazing uh, opportunity to be able to share. It's been know? amazing. It's yes. been amazing, Mawa. Thank you so much. We know there's a lot to talk about. Absolutely. But, uh, um, Absolutely. You know, chapter one, is, it's, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Fantastic. And so, look, um, if you're looking for these books, you can find them uh, at Barnes & Noble. They are on Amazon. They are available on our Dr. Malapo Selepe's website, drmalaposelepe.com. You can also find them at um, drmolaposelepe.africa. And if you're in Africa, you can also go to www.tekelot.com. 
please read these books and we would love to hear some of your feedback. If you've got the book and you've read the book, what are your thoughts? What do you think about um, what Dr. Mlapo has, has said and what other scholars that he has quoted in his books have said? Uh, so it's been fantastic. Uh, we hope to see you again um, in a few short uh, days to talk about Chapter 2 and the rest of the books. It's been great. Thanks. Looking forward. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, enjoying the episode with us. We really enjoyed uh, being with you. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe and click a notification button.